The Mile High City has a rich history of indulgence and vice. Born out of a gold rush, prospectors and gamblers flock to Denver in hopes of finding wealth. Whether celebrating a newly acquired fortune or lamenting dashed dreams, Denver's bars have served a vital role in the lives of the city's residents. So fill up your glass and get ready to take a tour of Denver's historic bars. Denver was filled with saloons in the very early days, the very first ones where the canvas tops, people took off their wagons and opened tent saloons. Uh, later they would do dugouts, then log saloons, then plank saloons, and uh, by the mid-1860s you have to ha actually have fairly substantial brick and stone saloons in downtown Denver. Ed Chase ran the Palace Saloon, and in many ways he ran the city of Denver. He came out from New York, opened a tent saloon in Golden, uh, then moved to Denver where he opened his famous Palace Theater. The Palace was a theater, uh, an illegitimate theater. The Rocky Mountain News critic who attended shows there said it was mostly leg art. Our neighbor across Tremont Street um, is a building called the Navarre, which around the turn of the last century um, was converted by um, Ed Chase and some other Denver underworld figures into a house of ill repute. And um, from that period, we get the rumors, the legends, maybe the memory of a tunnel that used to go from the basement in the front part of the Navarre under Tremont Street to the basement of the Brown Palace because the area in the hotel directly opposite the Navarre was originally the gentleman's smoking lounge. And it would have been a pretty discreet way for them to go back and forth to the Navarre without being seen by all the uh, Snoopy Trinity Methodists here over at the end of the street. Um, there's really very little evidence of a tunnel on our side of uh, the street, but over on the other side in uh, the Navarre, which is currently owned by billionaire Philip Anschutz, in the basement they have uncovered a set of tracks about as wide as ore car tracks, which are proceeding in a tunnel directly toward the Brown Palace Hotel until they run into a brick wall partway under the street. So um, something was definitely there. We just like to say its use will remain forever a matter of speculation. Bars were basically centers of commerce, you know, and it wasn't unusual if there was a disagreement between issues of commerce that they would take it out to the street. There is a story uh, of, um, of Shorty, and you know, he was, a, he was an excellent marksman and he had this uh, great reputation which evidently a, a robber didn't know about because he came in one night and he stuck the place up, and uh, you know everyone was calm. And Shorty said, "Just calm." Gave him the money to the register, but as as the robber was leaving, instead of just leaving, he he uh, pistol whipped one of the one of the waitresses as he left. Gave her a big plug, and then took off up Osage Street. And Shorty calmly walked out, pulled his weapon, and shot the guy as <laughs> he ran away. I, I shouldn't be laughing, but you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's like walking into a place where there's guns all over the walls. Is <laughs> I don't know. I guess people rob gun shops, but I don't know how smart they are. <laughs> Early life in the 1850s and 1860s when people were first coming here was not necessarily an easy life. In those early days, of course, you'd look for any kind of pleasure and entertainment. And alcohol, which was uh, either homemade or one of the earliest of the liquors that people would drink was called Taos Lightning. It was an odd mix of distilled and fermented cactus or some of the plants that they had available down there. And some of it was good and some of it was not so good, but it did provide a little bit of a kick for the people in those days. 